Uh, you received a connection card a little ago, and so with that connection card, we just encourage you to take a moment and fill that out. Let us know you're in the house this morning if you're a regular attendee. And if you're a first-time guest, we'd love to get to know you a little bit better and, and just tell you how much we appreciate you being here this morning. We love being able to worship together. And um, it's a privilege. We, we, we all want to, uh, one of our goals is there's just a, a spirit of hospitality here that you sense the power and presence of the Holy Spirit in such a real tangible way. And um, thank you so much. Also, on the back of that connection card, if you would like to this morning, feel free just to give any comments about how you thought the announcements went. Uh, Nick is always looking for critiques. Critiques and light criticism. No, light criticism. Hey, anybody glad you're in the house of the Lord this morning? David said that was, I was glad they said that you're in the house of the Lord. I think y'all thought there was a bomb going off over there. Y'all thought the buzzer was going off uh, as the emergency light. We've got to change some batteries here. Um, it did that the other day and then it quit. So I, we didn't know where, where it stood. But apparently, you know if it's going to go wrong, it'll go wrong at, in the middle of the service, right? Well, this morning we are in our third series, third portion, third um, sermon in the series that we've been talking about breaking bad. Shattering bad habits for God habits. And just to set that up, we talk about in our culture, breaking bad often means someone has turned to bad and running bad. But we said the other side of that, because the word breaking has a double meaning, it also can mean snapping or, 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 or severing something in two. And we said that what we need to do is quit breaking towards bad, running to bad. What we need to do is snap it and to separate ourselves from those bad habits. And what we need to embrace in our life is God habits. And we said there's a difference between just not good habits, but God habits. We said there could be a lot of good habits that's, that's really in this world, that there are good things that we pursue, but what we need to be sure that we're taking a hold of are God habits, those actions in our life that transform us, those actions in our life that lead us to godliness and the, and, and, and the relationship um, and healthy spiritual living. Those are the things we need to pursue in our life. And so this morning on your outline, we're going to talk about creating God habits. Just to review real quickly, we said that, you see, the Bible tells us that, that there's a way that seems right to man, but the end is destruction, that it's just not enough to, to live good, we need to live godly. And God wants to do some amazing things in, in our lives. God wants to do some amazing things in your life. And I hope that today you're not satisfied with where you're at spiritually. I pray today that you're you have a hunger to go to a new spiritual place and your walk with God. And I pray today that as we start that journey, you'll pursue it. But the reality is that we are, we are what we repeatedly do. We form habits and habits form us. They shape our actions. You see, our actions demonstrate our character. And many times our habits are rooted in what we believe. And so those bad habits often infiltrate our life. And they derail us from the plan God has. Our scripture theme that we've been looking at comes out of John, James 1.25. And it says it this way. Read on the screen behind me. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty. And James unpacks this by comparing a man who looks in a mirror and he walks away and he forgets what he looks like. He says the one who looks into God's law in the perfect law, the law of liberty. And notice this word, and perseveres. That word's a powerful word because it, persevere means that you don't give up. Persevere means that when you blow it, you get up and you keep running. Persevere means that, that you set your mind on finishing. You, you set your mind on finishing well. And what are we persevering in? Being no hearer of the word who forgets, but a doer who acts. That we live out God's word every day in our life. That we live out these good habits, these God habits. And he says that if you do that, notice the last line there. He will be blessed in his doings. The Lord will meet you in your doing. And not only will he meet you and give you power to live that way, he will also empower your actions to be effective. You see, we said we often have upward aspirations. We all hope to get to change. We all hope to be transformed. We all hope that we can lay something down. We all hope to do better. But we have downward behaviors. We have behaviors that, that pull us down. Uh, many times our behaviors do just the opposite. Well, we know we need to get up and go to prayer at 6 a.m. in the morning. 
We would rather lay in the bed. I understand it. it is a, hey, there is not a morning that I go out for prayer that I don't have to crucify this flesh. Because the flesh says, hey, I want to sleep. But there's something, there's a trade-off to develop a godly habit. You see, hope is a great motivator. And we hope for great things, but the reality is that, that hope is just a motivator. You have to have a plan and a strategy to build something in your life. You said, Pastor, it sounds like hard work. And I would tell you that it is hard work. That's why everybody doesn't do it. That's why most people take the easy way. But you must understand this morning that you are the only one who can change where you're at through the power of the Holy Spirit. You have to partner with what God wants to do in your life. And somewhere we have to take responsibility for our own spiritual growth and determine that we want to go somewhere that we've never been before. And then we have to allow the Holy Spirit to take us there. It's sad to say some of us, the only way he can take us any place is kicking and screaming. But we need to partner with him and lean into what God is speaking in our life and let him begin to transform us. So many times we're focused on just stopping a habit and we don't ever really get to the root source because it goes much deeper than just the habit itself. It goes to, to, the, to, to the root of what causes that action. But I want to tell you that everything worth having is worth working for. Going to a new spiritual level is worth working for. Going to a deeper place in your marriage is worth working for. Being a good parent is worth working for. Being a good disciple is worth working for. Nothing worth having, nothing, no, no, nothing worth having will come easy. Everything that is worth having will always cost you some investment out of your life. That's why we take the first part of this year and we do prayer and fasting. We take those 21 days and we, we, we make God the first thing we focus on in our year. One reason I'll share with somebody this morning because 21, 21 is a biblical number. It's got a biblical tie to it. It's, 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 got a, it's one of those special numbers that God has. But, but beyond that, also psychologists tell us that 21 days, if you can stop a habit for 21 days, most likely you can walk away from it. And if you'll start a good habit, a God habit, for 21 days, you can stay consistent with it. You see, what we starve dies, what we feed thrives. We have to ask ourselves, what are we feeding? I would encourage you this morning, say yes to some God things in your life. Say yes to prayer, to fasting. Say yes to, to G2 groups. Say yes to, to Wednesday night table talk. Say yes to to a place and to a first Sunday night encounter. Say yes to, to prayer and communion tonight and allow the Holy Spirit to show up in your life and take you on this journey. You see, we are I want to give you some four over this course we've been talking about four God habits to replace bad habits. Last week we or the first week we started we talked about the priority of making God first. And there is a blessing that comes with first. Whatever we place first in our life, uh, if we give it to the Lord, then it is a blessing that comes on. It sets a precedent for our life. And so there's something about when we take the first of our, our, our money, we take the first of our time, we take the first of our day, we take the first of our week, like Sunday. That's what this is, remember? I mean, remember what Sunday is. Sunday is the first day of the week. We take the first of our month. We take the first of our year. All of those have spiritual impact, and God's able to take the rest and bless it. Last week, we talked about the power of relationships. And we talked about how important it was to have healthy connections in our life. And, and, and we talked about uh, selecting relationships wisely. We talked about cultivating significant relationships. We talked about building reconciliations, broken relationships. And, and how to forgive one another. We talked about separating ourselves from some toxic and poisonous relationships. We talked about running after and initiating some influential relationships in our life, people who are going to impact us spiritually. And we talked about four powerful relationships that we need, and that is a relationship with our church, a relationship with godly friends, a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a missional partner, and then most of all, our relationship with God. And today, we're building off of that as we look and we talk about the power of thoughts. You see, one of the, one of the biggest battlefields is the battlefield of our mind. And our thoughts are powerful this morning. I remember a drug slogan as a teenager said that a mind is a terrible thing to waste. 
And the reality is that often we are defeated in our mind long before we ever start the journey. In the Old Testament, they don't use the mind too much. They actually use the word heart. So some of the scriptures that I read to you this morning, they may have the word heart there, but where the word heart is, today we would replace that with mind. In the Hebrew culture, the mind and the heart were connected. That's why Jesus, out of the bones of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out, out, out of the heart, mind, the mouth speaks. What's really inside of you comes out. What you're thinking really comes out. That's why David talks so much about how his heart, and, you know, and you meditate. And it's important that you understand the power of our thought life. And so the habit that we need to break this morning, the breaking the habit of negative and destructive thinking in our life. Because our thoughts are so powerful. Look at some of these quotes by famous people. Gandhi said it this way, a man is, is but the product of his thought that he thinks he becomes, what he thinks he becomes. Look at this one, nurture your mind with great thoughts. You see, you've got to nurture those thoughts in your life. The mind, Earl Nightingale says, the mind moves in the direction of our currently dominant thought. That, notice that, that whatever dominates your mind, the thoughts that dominate your mind, that's the area you move into. That's going to be powerful. We're going to build on that because Scripture supports that. James Joyce says the action of men are the best interpreter of their thoughts. He says what he's saying is that what you think on, you actually begin, you think on it long enough and then you begin to do it. That can be good and bad. You think on the wrong thing long enough, you'll begin to do it. You think on the right thing long enough, you begin to do it. I remember reading an article <laughs> about this black businessman that was very influential. And they asked him, he grew up in, in, in the inner city of Chicago. And they asked him, what was the biggest influence? He come from, he, he didn't have a father. His, his mother was a drug addict and he was raised by his grandmother. And they asked him about the role that she had in his life. And he said, yes, my grandmother was very influential in my life. They said, do you link all your success to her? He said, no, I don't. He said, what really changed me, he said, was the words that were spoken on. He said, every day, he said, my grandmother would give me a nickel. And I would walk in the little corner store on the way home from school to get a piece of bubble gum. He said, and there was an older black man in there that every day he would look at me and he would say, boy, you're going to be something one day. <laughs> You've got stuff, success written all over you. You're going to achieve some great things. And he said, every day I walked in there, I would buy that piece of bubble gum, and he would say something over my life. Amen. He said, I look back to those because when I, when I was facing the hard times in high school and in college and wanted to drop out, he said, I would go back to those words that something was spoken over me that I, I was going to be much more. I look at my own life. I, I, when my father wasn't necessarily a great biblical example, there were godly men in my life who spoke things over me. I'll never forget some of the words that Nelson Jones and, and, and Paul Beatty spoke in my life. Will Goldman, the, the former pastors and, and friends that, that spoke things to me that, that called out greatness. You see, we have to have someone because there is something in us. Thoughts are powerful. How we think, we become. So your life will be marked by how well you control your thoughts. And none of us will change our lives until we change the way we think. Hear that? None of us will change the way our lives until we change the way we think. The problem is some of us have got stinking thinking. You know what I mean? we got stinking thinking. You see, let's talk about the power of the thought this morning. Because you've got to learn to master your thoughts. If you, if you allow stinking thinking to rule your life, listen, you're going to always see these things in the negative. You're going to always see these things in the red. You're going to always see things the way they should not be. You're going to always see them contrary to what God is trying to do in your life. And you're going to always minimize God and always build up the circumstances. You see, it begins not in the doing, but in the way we think. So many times we're worried about what we do, but see, those doings that we're going to see later are rooted in how we think. Ecclesiastes says it this way, A wise man's heart inclines him to the right, but a fool's heart is to the left. Now, I don't think that's, I don't think Psalm is making a, a political statement about right wing and left wing, but here's what I do know. He says that the heart 
will lead you, if you focus on things on the right side, on the, on the, on the God side of things, he said your heart will lead you that direction. But the opposite is true too. If you focus your heart on the other side, it's going to lead you in a different direction down towards wrong living instead of right living. Proverbs 4.23 says, keep your heart with all diligence. In other words, that could be as equal as to keep your mind pure. Keep your, guard your mind. Because from it is the spring of life. You see, how you think, the way a man thinks in his heart, so shall he do. Your thoughts are powerful this morning. Your thoughts are going to impact how you live. Your thoughts will determine your direction you take in your life. I want to give you some th thoughts this morning to think on, to ponder on. You see, everything is birthed out of my thought. Everything is birthed by thought. Every behavior is birthed by a thought. It begins by thinking about it and then doing it. And before you change the behavior, you must change the thought that gave birth to the behavior. You see, we're so busy trying to change the behavior, we haven't got to the root. But why did I think that? Why did I do that? What was the desire? What was the thought that gave birth to that action? That's why he says, guard your mind. That's why you need to guard, especially the first part of your day. Because listen, if the first thing you do is roll out and turn on the news or turn or get on Facebook, Satan will make sure you get something to poop on your parade. <laughs> He'll do it every time. The first thing I try to do when I open my eyes is say, God, I need you this morning. Would you just take my day? Would you order my Before my feet ever get to get out of bed. Before they ever hit the floor, God, you take this. This belongs to you. <clears throat> if you you got to be sure the negative influence will impact you. Look at what Paul writes in Romans 12. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How do you get transformed? By the renewal of your mind. By testing, you may discern what is the will of God, that good, acceptable, and perfect. You see, you've got to renew your mind. So you, what you feed your mind is important. What you focus on, give God the first part of your day. The second thing is not only it, it's what we think shapes how we feel and how we see the world around us. You see, what we think determines how we feel about something. You ever had somebody just tell you what they thought and you knew exactly how they felt? We don't, well, don't tell me how you feel because when they share, they just, they just burn it out. You see, often we blame our spouses, our bosses, our teacher, our neighbors, the economy, the guy in traffic for how we feel. But the reality is, is they're not... That our feelings had to do with our thoughts, not their actions. Mm. <laughs> See, really, it's our thoughts toward those things that determine how you feel. You have to choose different thoughts in those situations. You see, you, you heard it said that you look at a situation, you said half full or half empty. I want to tell you how you see that will impact how you see God. I had, a, I had a friend one time who, who um, used to be here, and, 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 and he was a, I love this guy, but anytime you talk to him, it was always negative. And, and, and Donnie was a great guy, but, but, but I asked him one time, I said, Donnie, I said, tell me something, man. I said, how come, man, that's every time we talk, we're playing, you always see the bottom. Goes, well, it's like this preacher. He said, I don't expect much, and I don't get it, and I'm not disappointed. <laughs> but I thought to myself, I said, and I thought to myself, do you really go through life that way? Do you really want to go through life always expecting the worst, do you? Not disappointed. Why not step out and believe God to do something bigger and greater and more abundant? Why don't you believe God to do something supernatural instead of always just, if I expect the worst, I won't be disappointed. <clears throat> I don't want to live life that way. I want to live a life that expects God to do what he said to do. Some of us, it means we have to filter our mind. I know I have to filter my mind. That's why you don't see me on Facebook a lot, because there's a lot of negative stuff. And there's so much drama on Facebook. There's all kinds of stuff out there, and, and everybody's got an opinion about this, and an opinion about an opinion. And um, social media has gone crazy today. And I'm just telling you, before you step out in that, you need to have balance. You need to know balance. 
As a matter of fact, and if you want me, please do not use Facebook Messenger. All right, it will take you two to three weeks to get me because I only log in maybe once or two weeks. Text me. You can. I am open for text. Six zero nine six nine five twelve zero four. I have no problem yet, but text me. Matter of fact, if you want to take your phone out now and text me so I'll know it, and on silent, I'll take that text. Just tell me who it is. Just say, hey, Pastor, this I don't know if you got my number, and just send it to me. <laughs> and if you need me, I'll, I will I will come to we'll contact. Philippians said this way, find brother, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about those things. That doesn't sound like what you find on CNN. It doesn't sound like what you find on Fox. It doesn't sound like any newspaper you picked up. It doesn't sound like anything you find on Facebook. You see, what we have to put at the heart of our time is fixing our eyes on those things that are honorable, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, and praiseworthy. He said, listen to what he says. What you have learned and received and heard, seen me, he said, practice these things. In other words, put God in the test. In computer's terms, we used to say it this way growing up. Garbage in, it was garbage out. Why don't you try God for a week? And watch, if you, don't, if you don't filter the stuff coming in your life for a week, filter out that negative stuff and look at how much difference and tell me about it next week. And I promise you that next week you'll be on a better spiritual high, you'll feel closer to God, you'll feel cleaner, and you'll feel more refreshed if you'll just filter what walks in your mind. See, that's what I want for you. I want you to know God's peace. He said when you do these things, if you're practicing, you'll have a peace. God's peace with you. You see, I may not be able to change your circumstance that you're in this morning. But I can definitely point you to how to have peace. And when you fix your mind on the right things, mom, dad, young person, when you fix your mind on the right things, there's a peace that passes all understanding. Amen. It's not built on this world. It's not built on situations. It's built on who he is. You fill your life with spiritual things, God's words, worship music, encouraging books, Encourage other people with God and words. The last thing is our thoughts determine our destiny. All thoughts will always determine our destiny. It will show you where you're going. And your thoughts this year will impact where you're going to be next year. What do you fix your mind on? Where do you sow? Look at how Paul writes in Galatians. He says, For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap from, reap from the flesh will reap corruption. But the one who sows the Spirit from the Spirit reaps eternal life. He says if you sow into the fleshly side of your life, into your natural desires, into, into those bad habits, he says you're going to reap bad stuff. But when you sow into the Spirit, you reap eternal life. Look at this. this I didn't create this thing. It means I'm going to take glory for it. But look at this little pulp point right now. It says this, so a thought, reap an action. So an action, reap a habit. So a habit, and reap a lifestyle. So a lifestyle, and reap your destiny. Notice how it all starts with a thought. You see, your thoughts will impact your destiny. If you don't like where you are going, you need to change the way you're thinking. If you don't like where you are today, you need to change the way you think. You see, you are here today because you are a product, because your thoughts brought you to this place. Amen. And where you will go tomorrow, you will be taken by the thought. You are a product of your thinking. Look at how Paul writes it to the Roman church. He says, for those of you who live according to the flesh and to the sinful desires, he says, because they set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, they set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Now notice where his focus is. Look at verse 6. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. He says, listen, if you set, he said, if you're thinking only fleshly things, you're thinking only worldly things, you're thinking only uh, only uh, 
uh, sinful nature things like sex and money and drugs and stuff and pride and greed and all the other stuff that goes with that. If you only think about that, then guess what? If that's what you think about, you're going to live according to those things you think about. But if you'll set your mind on the things of God, on the things uh, above, he said, then guess what? You're going to see that lived out in your life. I would tell you that our, our largest problem is our thought life. So let me give you four practical ways real quickly. Four practical ways to empower your thoughts for living out your faith. Empower my thoughts. <clears throat> Number one, <coughs> discover a strategic plan to discipline my thoughts. If I'm going to have victory, I've got to discover a plan to govern my thoughts. <coughs> Second Corinthians, Paul writes and says, <clears throat> Though we walk in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh. Can I tell you that if you talk to anybody who's waging a war, they have a strategy and they have a plan. They don't just go to the wiggy book and whoop somebody. They've got a plan. Any of you guys who have served in the military know that there's always a plan. And, and the Bible has laid out a plan for us. He's given us weapons and he's given us a plan. And look at this plan. <clears throat> For the weapons of our world, they are not of the flesh, but they have divine power destroying the strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion that raises, that's raised against the knowledge of God. And look at this last thing. We, and every thought we take captive. <clears throat> we have determined we're going to take those thoughts captive and that we're going to replace them with a God thought. I had a pastor one time who told me how he, how he was delivered from smoking. And he said, I used to carry my pack of cigarettes right here in my pocket all the time. And he said, and when the Lord convicted me that it was time to lay those down, I needed to, and, I, and the Lord, the Holy Spirit kept something, I needed to be free from that addiction in my life. He said, here's what I did. He said, I took that. And he said, it was prompted by the Holy Spirit. And the Lord said, you need to get you one of those Gideon Bibles, Jim. And he said, I want you to underline some power verses in it. And he said, every time you get ready, when well, you would reach in there and pull out a cigarette, he said, you reach out and you put a scripture. And that's the way he did it. And he could quote scripture after scripture after scripture because every time he instead of reaching for a cigarette, he reached for a word or a promise. I promise you, if it worked for him, God has no respect for a person. It'll work for you. And it just won't work for cigarettes. It'll work over those other areas of your life. And if you'll all of a sudden hold to a promise, God will begin to, his truth will take root in your life. What are we feeding those thoughts on? I'll tell you that most of us today, our thoughts come from TV and the internet or negative relationships. Listen, you've got you to take those things captive. You need to find somebody who can hold you accountable. You know, parents, you need to know what your kids are looking at on the internet. You need to have some kind of accountability software on, on, on their system. We, we need to be accountable. My wife can pick up my cell phone at any time. I, I, I will open my email for her any time. She... Matter of fact, I think on my tablet, she, my tablet, her, the tablet she uses actually linked to my phone, so she, she can open my email at any time and read emails that I get. Because there's accountability. We need those in our life. And can I think the biggest way to do that is goes back to the Word. You've got to put the Word in your life. Just like that, my, my pastor friend, he put the Word. The Word is powerful this morning. The Word has the power to present you uh, and, and, and to defend you and, 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 to, and to keep you safe, to guard your heart. Paul writes and says this, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the vision of soul and spirit, of joint and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You see, don't only to read the Bible, but let the Bible read you. Get, get, get a plan to get in the Word. Listen, I think one of the greatest apps you can download on your phone is you version. Because you, there's a daily Bible reading. There's tons of Bible reading plans. Pick up. I mean, listen, you got one of these today. You've got a super Bible study tool right here in your own hand. If not, pick up a one-year study Bible. But somehow get a plan to read the Bible. And then don't get, don't, don't get wound up tight about it. What I mean by that is I know people, I'm OCD to some degree. 
And so what happens is that if I miss reading everything yesterday, then I feel like somehow I've got to catch up. But if I miss some every day, then all of a sudden I've got to read 40 chapters to catch up. And then so, so what happens is I mentally, then I, I, this is the way it is with, with other things too, then I put it off because I realize how far I'm behind. Listen, start fresh. God's a God of mercy, compassion. He would just rather you have one scripture than no scripture. But get in the Word. Listen, can I tell you, young people, you want to grow mentally and you, 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 want, you want wisdom? Read a proverb of the day. There's 31 different proverbs. Read one, a chapter every day. And watch. I mean, I'm telling you, Solomon has wisdom. There, there is direction for life there. The second is you've got to discover an environment to tell God your thoughts. In other words, I'm telling you, you've got to pray this one. You've got, to, you've got to find a place where you can shut down the world and you can recenter yourself in God and you can say, God, here's what I'm thinking. You know God cares about what you're thinking. God wants to hear your heart. He wants to, he wants to speak things to you, but he just doesn't want to hear what you guys say. You see, so many times we think prayer is going to be formal. We think prayer is, oh, thou great mighty God. And we think if we can't speak that way, then God doesn't want to spend time with it. Listen. Most of us have no problem talking. If we were the right person, we could talk. Even those of us who are shy, if we were the right person, we'll talk. God just wants you to talk to him. It doesn't have to be formal. You don't have to use these and thous. You don't have to quote the Lord's Prayer. Just talk to him. Just don't make a wish list. Because sometimes we're guilty about that. We'll come to God and we have a list of things we want. But we don't give him time to speak back. We need to be willing to listen. Look at what the word says. Isaiah says, you keep him at perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. You need peace? Spend some time talking to the one who cares about your situation. He cares about what you're walking through. It's not just our plan, but it's his plan. Fix your eyes on him. Look at how the law says it. Set your minds on things that are above and not on the things of earth. You see, we have to set our minds, notice that, set our mind on the things that are above. So many times we're focused, our priority is everything down here on earth, and we forget that the kingdom, what was it? There was a guy one time who said it this way, he said, if you seek first the kingdom of God, everything else will be given to you. I believe it's in red. I believe it was Jesus. If we'll seek first his kingdom, can I tell you, this world is full of trouble. You will not find your peace here. But if you'll fix your mind on the things above, God's peace will be able to rule and reign in your heart. Yeah. And then David said this way. You see, we have to come to God and we have to give him the chance to look inside of us. And this is one of the things, as hard as it is, <coughs> my most in, in, intimate moments are when I pray this scripture. And I say, search me, Lord. <coughs> know my heart. Try me. And know my thoughts. Know my thoughts. God, you know my thoughts. Try them. Tell me how God thoughts. Not my thoughts. Sometimes we have to do that. And there are times the Holy Spirit says, you know, Jim, the problem is the way you're looking at this situation. You made this person in here. You, you're, you're fearful over that. Or this particular thing's going on. And, and it's my thoughts. And it's only because I've laid my thoughts out before him and I've given him the invitation to search them that he searches them and he speaks to them. Some people say, God never speaks to me. Have we ever given him the opportunity to search us? <coughs> say, God, search my heart. They have understood that. Give God a moment to speak back to you. The third thing is you've got to discover a person to grow and stretch your thoughts. You've got to find people who are going to stretch your thoughts. God designed us while we were saved by God. We, we, we were not designed to do the spiritual journey by ourselves. We were designed to do it with one another. I think it's amazing that James 5, 16 tells us that if we confess our faults, and we, or we, confess, or we confess our sins one to another, we're healed. That, that it, see, if we confess them to God, we're forgiven, but if we confess them to one another, we're healed. That's pretty powerful. It speaks to the power of transparency. It speaks to the, po the power of accountability. It speaks to the power of relationship. And we need relationships. That's why you need a G2 group. You see, you can't get intimate in a situation in a setting like this. But when you get six or seven in a class, ten in a class, you can get a little more intimate. 
And then when you have a missional relationship, that one person, that once a week you guys are meeting with each other, once a week you're emailing or you're text messaging, and you're talking about what God is speaking in your life in that moment, and you're sharing from God's Word, and what happens is iron sharpens iron, and you grow spiritually. You need that kind of relationship in your life. I'm telling you, if you want to go to a new spiritual plane, you need to find that person. You see, you've got to control the environment of negative thoughts that are around you. Now, sometimes you're in situations where you can't control the environment, but you need to learn how to put boundaries up. But listen, when you can control the environment, I'm not going somewhere. If I have a choice to hang with somebody who's going to cuss like a sailor all day and just constantly bring them up, let me give you an example of my own life. I worked for a lady one time. Her name was June Barker. She was about this tall. And she had a mouth that would make a sailor blush. <laughs> and, and for some reason, God gave me favor with her. She liked me. And listen, the list of people she liked was about three. <laughs> and her ex-husband wasn't on it. Her granddaughter, her daughter, and then she liked me. And for some reason, but, but, there, but, she was, but no one could ever please her. She was constantly negative. Whatever you did could not would not, did not satisfy her. You could have always done better. And it wasn't long from working with that that I began to be the same way. And one of the journeys that I had to go on over about six years when I separated myself from Dominic and when I no longer worked there was I realized that had taken root in my life and I realized that I was bringing that home and that I was living with that attitude that no one could please me. And I realized that negative influence had sneaked off. Better watch what you give your ear to. Amen. And sometimes you need to distance yourself from negative because negativity is like a cancer. I have some other friends that are godly people, but I have put boundaries in my life and my exposure to them because sometimes they're just half empty people. They're good people, but they're just half empty. I want somebody who's going to bring out God's best. I want somebody who can dream God's dreams with me. I want somebody. And I often ask the Holy Spirit to be in my heart when I speak things that are not that way. And I'll tell you, I give you permission to call me out. If I'm around you and we're talking about that, I say one of those things, and it doesn't sound like God says, so hey, Pastor, you remember that sermon you preached the third week of January? Let's speak God things. Ephesians 4 says, let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth. Listen, what, so what comes out of your mouth? But only such that is good for the building up as it's the occasion. One of the things I tell our leadership all the time is to speak prophetic words over people. I want you to walk in this place and I want you to get a prophetic word. I want you to have someone speak an encouraging word over your life. But just as much as you want an encouraging word, I'm going to challenge you to speak an encouraging word for somebody. Don't just come looking for a word. Come to give a word. Come to bless somebody. Man, even if it's, man, those are the best looking shoes I've ever seen, Brandon. Those things, they are just amazing. <laughs> I'm not telling you to butter up somebody, but look for something genuine that you can speak in their life. Those are sharp shoes. <laughs> what I'm telling you this morning is we need to build up. Look at what Paul says. 10, 20, uh, Hebrews 10. And let us consider how to stir one another to love and good work. Not neglecting meeting together as the habit of some. And I think that's a habit we've got into this last day. We come to church when we feel like it. And because we're thinking about the wrong thing, we often don't feel like it. Oh, can I get a better amen? Amen. amen. <laughs> but encouraging one another. <laughs> encouraging one another. Encourage one another. We've got to encourage one another. Speak. Blessed. I want you to be blessed. I want you to feel the potential. I want to call out God's best in your life. And I want you to be in an environment where that can happen. I want the assembly to be that kind of environment where we're calling out God's best in each other's life. I want you to have the best marriage. I want you to have the best relationship with your kids. I want you to have the best home life. I want you to have the best I want you to love this church and I want you to love one another. And I want you to say, man, I can't wait to get to church because I know when I go, I'm going to be blessed. 
look how you're going to bless somebody else. Look for an opportunity to sow into somebody else's life. I can tell you uh, in prayer, I stand up here and I, and I prof prophesy and I pray over our church and I, pray, I speak blessing. And those of you that have been with me in prayer, there's not probably one that I would stand and, and speak over our families and say, hey, I'm, and call out God's best over your life. Then you've got to discover your purpose and focus your thoughts around it. Can I tell you, the happiest you'll ever be, the healthiest you'll ever be is when you know your purpose and you know what God puts you here and then what your thoughts are all about what God has called you to do. And can I tell you, you can have all the money in the world, you can have all the means in the world, you can have everything you think you want. And if you don't know why you're here, if you don't have a cause, you'll be miserable. Because we all call for significance. <coughs> we all want to know that we're making a difference in the world. And can I tell you, the Bible tells us clearly that God has a plan for your life. Jeremiah says, I know my plans for you, but to prosper and give you a hope and a future. God has a plan for you. And when you discover that plan, all of a sudden your focus is around it. And you discover who why God put, why God puts you here and what you're called to do. And things begin to change. The way you look at life changes. And, 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 and can I tell you, on those low days when you remember what you're called to do, it'll put a fire in your bones. On those days when you want to get discouraged, it, it'll be like it'll be energy for you. It'll be encouragement when you're low. It'll even be motivation to walk godly when you're tempted to make a bad choice because you think about how many people are looking at you. I remember Jeannie Mayo preaching a message one time uh, about the space shuttle that blew up. and she, said, she, she made this illustration. She said, you know, she said the fallout, because it was so high in the atmosphere, was over three states, Louisiana, Texas, Arkansas, Maybe parts of Oklahoma, Oklahoma. And she said, the higher you go in the ministry, the higher more. And she said, if you blow it, the bigger the fallout. Yeah. And that's the reality. Sometimes that keeps you motivated, though. Yeah. Because you should remember, Paul, Paul, Paul knew that. That's what Paul said. Man, that's the last thing I want to do is to preach the gospel. And at the end, come back. You see, sometimes when you know your purpose, you know, you know what's, what, what you've been called to do, it motivates you. Paul said to this in Romans, he says, do not be conformed to this world. We've read this a couple of times. I won't pull out some other truth. In. He says, look at the last. He says, when you renew your mind, he said, that by testing you will discern what is the will of God. He said, when you get the mind of God, you'll know what God's will is for your life. You'll know his perfect will. You'll know his acceptable will for you. That's what he wants to take you. That's what we have place. And I want to challenge you to go through place. I want to challenge you to, as we get ready to, 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 to launch one of these in, in the next month, at the end of February, I want you to sign up for place. If you haven't been through it, and say, listen, I want to discover my personality. I want to discover, I want to learn my spiritual gifts, my abilities, my talents, my, communi uh, my communicating passions, and experiences of life. And there's always more information. If you want more information, you can always check your connection card. Nick, if you'll come on the close. <coughs> Last thing. Give me one second. Um, 30 seconds. You've got to discover power that will energize and transform your thought life. There's a power to transform your thought. What's that power look like? It's the Holy Spirit. You see, God doesn't just give you this to do on your own. He's he wants to empower you with his spirit. The Bible talks about Moses, and Moses' word with this. God called Moses. Isn't God going to always ask you to do something that's bigger than you? When you find your purpose, don't be overwhelmed by it. It's going to be bigger than you. It's going to be big. And God's going to say this. He's going to say, but we can do it. If you'll let me help you. Why? Because God don't want you to do it in your own ability, because then it's all about you. But when it's so much bigger than you, like he spoke to Moses, and Moses, I want you to deliver my people. Moses said, I can't handle that. That's too big a job. As you see in Exodus 13, Moses began to get a picture of that because he realized, and there's a passage there where he, he sees the glory of God. He says, God, I'm not going to move from this spot if your glory don't go before me. Your presence doesn't go. Today we have the presence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to empower you to live out the purpose of the plan that God has for you. But you need the Holy Spirit. The problem is that we don't understand power. But I want to tell you, you read the gospel. God came to give us power. 
Some of that's because we've seen power abused and we've seen power in all kinds of ways. But I want to tell you, there is a real sovereign power of the Holy Spirit that enables us to do ministry, that enables us to do the supernatural. The Bible tells us that, that the Spirit of God searches the deep things of God and He knows the plan of God for your life. Ephesians 3.20 tells us that now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask, think, according to the power that works within us. What is that power? The Holy Spirit. That day he'll do above anything you could ever imagine if you allow him to flow through. But here's what's got to happen. You've got to invite him and say, Holy Spirit, use him. Holy Spirit, I give myself to you. I need the more power in me. And by praying a simple prayer like that and then listening to the Holy Spirit who leads you, looking for Him to move in you, being obedient to what He speaks, the power of God will reside in you. You may not understand the power, but that doesn't stop us from needing it. God's trying to take us to a deeper place. He's trying to take you to a different place. And he wants to do something in you that is bigger than anything you could ever imagine. But it'll come through the power of the Holy Spirit. The only way you'll have victory over those thoughts is through the Holy Spirit. The only way you'll ever take hold of the promise and your purpose that God's called you to is through the Holy Spirit. We can't run from Him. And I challenge you this week, as you lay down some things and you, and you say, listen, I'm going to filter some stuff out of my life this week and I'm going to be able to listen. Pray that person, Holy Spirit, I'm listening to you. I need your power. I need more of you in my life. And as you pray that, God's going to get to work. He's going to get to work. Value your hearts with this. Value your hands. Father, today we're in this house. And we're asking for more of you, Jesus. You need Jesus. Holy Spirit, what are you trying to say to us right now? Speak to each of us. Maybe you're in this place and you're far from God today. Maybe this morning you need to surrender to Him. Maybe this morning you're wandering. You want to be brought back home. Do you want to come close? Do you want to know Him? Do you Want to surrender your life to Him. Today, if that's you, and you're in this place, say, Pastor, I want to surrender my life to Christ. If that's you, come quickly. Ask you quickly to raise your hand. I'm going to lead you in a little prayer. If that's you, just one very quickly. One. If not, then I want to ask you this. How many would pray this prayer this morning? Say, God, I want more of the Holy Spirit in my life. That every thought, that every part of me, I want to be empowered by your Spirit. If that's you, won't you stand in your feet? I want to pray with you. As Brandon comes, why don't you just stretch your hands with him and let's pray this prayer. Father, today, Lord, I ask you. I pray over these that are standing to God today. Let your spirit reside and draw them closer to you. Empower them, Lord, with your word. Empower them with your truth today. And Lord, take them where they've never been. Father, I pray that you would do great and mighty things.